from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London, where we've had fireworks going off for both Diwali and Bonfire Night here. But cricket is facing its own explosive situation surrounding Yorkshire County Cricket Club and an investigation into racism at the club, which at the heart of it has issues of governance, of process, of transparency, education. It is a sorry, sorry mess and it is not going away anytime soon. Hi, it's Stu Maxwell for the ABC in Sydney. England's about to arrive in Australia and Joe Root's talking about the gabatoires no longer a death sentence for English teams. We will see what happens. But we're watching this other show at the moment in the in the Middle East and uh, who knows, Australia might even get to the final. Maybe they'll be playing England, Ali. <laughs> they could be. Very possible, yeah. Hello, everybody. Happy Diwali. I'm Charu Sharma for All India Radio in Bangalore. These are very strange days. On one end, of course, the festive season's peaking with Diwali, lots of uh, festivities, celebration, happiness, joy. And on the other hand, <laughs> extreme lament and despair at the goings on with the Indian cricket team in the UAE. Uh, a lot of people keep asking, so Charu, what are our chances still? And I have a favorite answer now, which I'm going to leave for a little later. All right, we will come to it. We'll tease it out of you. <laughs> Let's chat about the men's T20 World Cup because, yeah, it's thrown up some really interesting stories, hasn't it, over the last week? And Pakistan becoming the first side to qualify for the semi finals. Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Scotland, meanwhile, have all gone out. And Pakistan have been really impressive. We'll come to them in a moment. But, Charu, I do want to talk about India because it's been an up and down tournament so far, thrashed by both Pakistan and New Zealand. I mean, struggling to take any wickets to speak of, but then they go and score the highest total of the tournament so far against Afghanistan with 210. Right, there's still an uphill battle, isn't there, to get to the semis, but I mean, did that match against Afghanistan alleviate some of the criticism in any way, or is this just papering over the cracks? Because, you know, let's face it, India will always be expected to beat Afghanistan. Yes, they were always expected to beat them, but uh, it's like applying just a little bit of salve on a very deep cut. It's really all over for India. The first two matches were horrendous, and the kind of margins we lost those matches, I mean, unimaginable. Uh, <laughs> You know, and of course, now to the answer, people say, what well, doesn't India still have a chance? And I say my standard answer these days, new answer is, Alison, and I ask you this, what is the closest figure to zero that you can think of? <laughs> zero point <laughs> one, 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 one. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it gets people thinking, and I say, that is the figure that uh, in terms of chances for India to make it through to the top two in their group. It's really, you know, it's very difficult right now. Too little, too late. And uh, Jim, we heard before that Afghanistan match, Jasprit Bumrah, uh, the Indian bowler, started talking about bubble fatigue. Is that an excuse or a genuine reason? I mean, they're not the only ones, surely. Come and live in Sydney or Melbourne for a couple of months. <laughs> You'll get bubble fatigue pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it sounds a bit hollow to me if that's a genuine excuse. They've just been a bit flat in those two games. Probably a good thing uh, that they're going to change the captain, Charo. People are, are now saying that the cricket board got rid of... Kohli because of his performances or his lack of performances or whatever. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was Kohli who decided that, listen, I don't want this additional responsibility. I've played enough, enough as a captain. I've got perhaps different priorities, a wife and child and everything else. And, you know, I'm just really tired of this whole T20 captaincy business. So it's a good time to move away as a sort of an installment plan to maybe move away from captaincy in the other forms as well as he goes along. Because he has reached a very iconic status. And I can't see anybody in the board or in world cricket telling Kohli what to do. Mm. How much then of a, a rebuilding job, also a re-energising job, is Rahul Dravid going to have to do as the new coach? Because since we last spoke, it has now been confirmed that Rahul Dravid will take over from uh, Ravi Shastri at the end of the T20 World Cup. So in what, is, what is the task ahead of him as the new coach? Well, I mean, is it a good time to quote Ian Chappell on the importance of a coach? The thing that <laughs> takes place to the ground. But, uh, yeah, Shane Ward? You know, yeah, true. Well, he does bring something new to the table, doesn't he? Just because of the kind of person he is. And of course, he's played just as much cricket as a lot of other very celebrated coaches or cricketers. So in a sense, he's lucky that uh, the, the UAE debacle is, is not really his problem. It's soon going to be over. And he'll uh, begin afresh with New Zealand touring India, which uh, could be uh, a tougher tour for New Zealand. 
what does he really do with the personnel he has? I don't think there's going to be a major change of personnel. He has what Ravi Shastri has in terms of personnel. Will he be able to effect some kind of changes in terms of the, the inspiration or the quality of inspiration that he brings in? And even more important for me personally, I'm a little old fashioned, is can he affect the culture of the Indian cricket team? Can he make them a little more humble? Can he get them all together and say, listen, forget the superstardom. Let's just go out there and kind of do what we really set out to do as professionals. So he's got a couple of challenges. And I say that only because it's a crown of thorns. And, and he, as a coach, he cannot really go out there and bat and bowl and catch and everything else that, you know, he was good at, I suppose, not bowling. Um, so I don't see major changes. If he's lucky enough that India does well at the start of his tenure, people will say, wow, well done. And if the team does badly against New Zealand, people say, well, what was the need of changing the coach? So, you know, it's a crown of thorns. Jim, been looking forward to us having a little chat about the England-Australia encounter at the T20 World Cup. England have been pretty flawless so far in their start to the competition, haven't they? Four out of four. But Joss Butler has been an absolute standout uh, in the games well, against Sri Lanka, where he got 100, as well as against Australia. And when England beat the Aussies by eight wickets with 50 balls to spare last Saturday, I mean, what was the response to that in Australia, Jim? England just simply being too strong? They got butlered. Well, it happened in the middle of the night. I don't think anyone saw it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> As if it didn't uh, happen. <laughs> yeah, it didn't really happen. Fake news. Um, so we wake up and heard the score. Oh, we thought, oh, God. No, we've lost another T20 game. We don't care, really. We're only interested in the ashes. Uh, the more so as we, we, as we flounder in this tournament. Uh, so uh, England are playing with a lot of confidence. They're uh, superbly led by Ian Morgan and um, Butler uh, playing superbly. But look, one game can turn all that around, as we know. Once you get to the semi-finals, uh, you can have a, a good or bad day out, and and that's it. So um, in England look really, really strong through their excellent bowling, pretty good fielding too, uh, and some quality in their batting. Um, but that's not to say that um, should they meet New Zealand or India in the semi-final, it might go wrong. Should they happen to play Australia, Pakistan, anyone in the final? But I mean, Joss Butler ha has been incredible. And the, the unbeaten 100 against Sri Lanka, what, 101 not out, and getting that 100 with a six off the last ball as well. He's now become the first England men's player to score 100 in every format of the game. Heather Knight has done it as, a, as an England women's player. But yeah, he, he is just outstanding. And I mean, it'll be a question as to whether he can translate that into test match cricket. But in terms of the T20 World Cup, Jim, yeah, you've got to back it up with the bowling. And England have taken wickets at the top and they've restricted power plays very well. But then when you've got someone like him who is in form, it's very difficult to stop, isn't he? He is. But um, it's like my old, old line about anyone can get a duck. Um, and it's, it's hard to um, assess someone's form if they keep getting ducks because they haven't got in. So even Butler can get a duck. England playing the superbly, and um, Morgan's the best captain of all these teams. So um, I, I think if you run, want to run a, a book on it, they're the favourites, no doubt about that. But we could be sitting here next week saying, well, that's bad luck. They shouldn't have lost that semi-final. And what of Pakistan then? Because they became the first side into the semi-finals. They had that 45-run win over Namibia, one of the nations who you know, has absolutely benefited from the exposure in this T20 World Cup. But yeah, like England, Pakistan have won four uh, out of four. I mean, how good is it to see them doing this well? They've got depth and variety in their batting, their bowling, um, and it's all falling into place. So uh, good luck to them, given the way they've been pretty much marginalised, if not ostracised, uh, by the cricketing world. That's right. And Jim, that leadership from the front with the bats has taken Barbara Zan back up to number one in the ICC T20 men's batting rankings. He's got, what, 350s in his first four matches. He's knocked David Milan off. And yeah, he it feels like he absolutely deserves that spot. Do you, do you reckon that as well? Oh, yes. He's an outstanding player. And... Uh, He's one of the reasons why they're doing so well. I'm, I actually woke up at four o'clock the other morning, and this is where I have to get the times right with you. And I turned the radio on, and uh, I heard the penultimate over of that Afghanistan Pakistan game, and I thought, Afghanistan's going to win this game. And that bloke came out and hit four sixes. 
Well, now to Australia and the Women's Big Bash League, which has reached the halfway point. And we've already witnessed what a super over and the second highest partnership ever in the competition. Now, viewing figures were also up at the start of the tournament. There was a 58% increase in television audience across the first five games compared to last year. Now, earlier this week, I spoke to the general manager of the Big Bash League, Alistair Dobson, just to assess how this year's competition is going. What's your take on why we're seeing this particular increase? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons and, and you couldn't go past simply the quality of the cricket. I mean, it's, it continues to improve every year. It's, you know, we think and we're confident it's the best cricket league in the world for women and, you know, the best players from all around the world playing. So I think you can largely put it down to just how watchable it is from a, from a spectacle and entertainment and quality of cricket perspective. But I think equally, you know, we, we've been able to get all 59 games of this year's season on television, which is the first time we've had all all games on TV, and and I think, um, you know, I also think a big part of it is is just the, the the players themselves and their openness and willingness to be part of the broadcast and give of themselves, whether that's being on the microphone or, um, you know, broadcasters so talk so glowingly about these players that just want to want to share the game with everyone, and and I think that really connects with the audience as well. So, yeah, it's been um it's been a great start, uh, and, you know, and, and I think. I think also we're now in the third year of, um, you know, standalone competition separate from the men's big bash, which I think has created a really unique spot in the Australian sporting calendar in that October, October, November off the back of our winter football codes before, you know, often the, the BBL starts and, and, and the men's test season often starts in that December period. So to carve out um, a dedicated window in October, November, I think was a risk at the time, but maybe not so much risky, albeit a bit of a leap because, mm. you know, I think for, for the first seasons of the first few seasons of the WBBL to have been played as double headers with, with the men's and that brings with it a bit more certainty around crowds and, you know, the scale that you can bring. So to separate the two was um, very much a calculated um, risk and a strategic move that had been a long time in the making and there'd always been an ambition of creating a, a longer summer of big bash if you like from from the women's through to the men's and i think um you know the, the risk was the risk or the, the the calculation was always based on crickets not traditionally in that october november window in australia are people going to come and, and be part of it and want to you know uh, take in cricket at that time and and, and they have um and then i think um what it's done is create just continue to create such a strong competition that um, whether it's people at the grounds or, or, or audiences on TV, just um, just keep wanting to engage with. Yeah, what would be your message to, to other nations who are, who are looking to evolve their women's game similarly? Is it confidence in the product, but marketing, a certain amount's got to surely go into that as well and promoting actually what you've got? Yeah, it's probably all those. I think firstly, um, it, it back, back in the product, back in the competition, that these are phenomenal athletes that are, great cricketers and bring such a competitiveness but also i think as i said a minute ago i think the strength that the wbbl brings and, and i think women's cricket broadly is is the the way that the athletes engage with the fans and with kids and with everyone who wants to be part of they're very open um athletes they're very um willing to be to be part of the broadcast part of the marketing part of the growth of the game they're also committed to to that aspiration that we that, that everyone has around the game so um back in the product but also um just, just back in the the, the personalities and the, and the athletes that that are, uh, that are involved because they um, they're so giving and um, they lead it for us pretty much. How important has it been to have the Indian players taking part? Got eight featuring this year alone. Oh, phenomenal! I think um, firstly the, the WBBL has such a rich history of players from all around the world wanting to come and play. Whether it's historically a lot of the, a lot of English players and South African players, more recently coming in big numbers and this year to have the Indian, obviously the Indian team out playing a, a you know, a national series prior to the WBB was such a, a great opportunity. And they they just bring another, another style, another, uh, you know, another type of cricket. Obviously there's big Indian community in Australia that really, um, that have really engaged as well. So um, it's been amazing. And I think you, know, you have to look at the the game so far. They've, they've often been, you know, the highest run scorers and been really involved in a lot of their team success. So uh, it's been great. Great to chat. Thanks, Alison. Alistair Dobson, General Manager of the Big Bash Leagues. Jim, what, what, what is your take on the WBBL, first of all, the, the competition as it's been so far this season? It's fast evolving into a, a very good, attractive competition. And it has its own window this year, perhaps more than before. 
uh, because of COVID and uh, men's cricket being disrupted, not played. A bit of Sheffield Shield, a bit of domestic one-day stuff, Australia playing somewhere else in the world. So they've grabbed the opportunity. And it really is um, the women's version of the IPL to a large extent because of the international players that are here. Uh, they've made a big difference to the flavour, the quality of the tournament, particularly those girls that can whack the ball. I uh, like to pray and uh, divine those names come to mind immediately. And Herman Precur, uh, I mean, they've, they've made a, a big difference to the series. Charu, with the eight Indian players that are in the WBBL, has there been any particular standout performances that you've enjoyed? Jim mentioned the, the big strikers, and I think they've all done rather well. And, and I agree with them completely. The, the WBBL is the, if I can, if nobody minds this comparison, the IPL of, for women. And they have this massive lead as well. However, Hamran Preet's, Harman Preet's done well. Smithy Mandana's done well, but she always does so silken and smooth. She may not be a massive hitter, but she's always among the runs. Jamima, a young friend we had on Stumped earlier, has also finally done well. I'm happy for her. And of course, um, uh, uh, our Shefali, the other striker. So, and Deepthi Sharma has played an all-round role. So at least five out of the eight have done reasonably well. Um, uh, there's a campaign here in India on the network, the, the WBBL is being shown, which really showcases the Indian players as well. So there's a lot of attention now, uh, deservedly so, for the women who've gone to Australia. Uh, and it does, I think it's going to, as it did for the first two or three went, just completely change, uh, or, or should we say exponentially increase the confidence that these girls have playing in international matches. So that's a huge plus. Well, that's all for this week's Stumped here on All India Radio. Don't forget that you can follow us on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sport. Make sure you use the hashtag BBC Stumped. For now, I'll say thanks to Chari Sharma and Jim Maxwell. And of course, to you all for listening. And we'll see you again next week. Bye bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.